Let us review the muscles of the orbit, their innervation, and the eye movements they control. There are six muscles controlling extraocular movements. These are controlled by three nerves. The oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, controls a majority of the muscles. Specifically, it controls superior and inferior rectus, medial rectus, and the inferior oblique. The trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4, controls one muscle, superior oblique. The abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6, also controls one muscle, lateral rectus. In this graphic, you can see the major muscles involved in moving each globe through that cardinal field of view. This is presented for study in a handout from this lesson. So how do we assess eye movements? There are nine cardinal planes of view. Instruct your patient to follow your finger with their eyes. Move your finger through the cardinal fields, stopping for one to two seconds at each extreme of gaze, before bringing gaze back to the center each time. As you lead the patient's eyes with your finger, observe for conjugate movement, meaning the globes move the same distance at the same time, and at each gaze endpoint, observe for nystagmus as you hold that point for two seconds. After each field is observed, test convergence by slowly bringing your finger toward the patient's nose and encourage them to follow. Look for pupillary constriction or meiosis as the eyes adapt for accommodation. More advanced testing can be done at the bedside. The red glass test involves putting a red glass in front of one eye. I use a camera filter for that. By convention, one should use the right eye. Then shine a light a few inches from the nose and ask if the red light is all that is seen or if there is separation either horizontally or vertically. Then move through all nine fields of gaze asking the same thing. Ask which position produces the greatest degree of separation. This indicates the muscle most involved. Now let's take a closer look at the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3. The nucleus of cranial nerve 3 is located in the midbrain. It exits from the midbrain ventrally between the cerebral peduncles. It passes through the cavernous sinus along with cranial nerves 4, 5, and 6, and then exits into the orbit. Cranial nerve 3 innervates four of the six extraocular muscles, the superior, inferior, and medial rectus, and the inferior oblique, plus the levator palpebrae, which raises the lid. The oculomotor nerve also carries parasympathetic fibers from the edinger westfall nucleus, which is also in the midbrain, providing the efferent pathway for the pupillary reflex. We can test the pupillary reflex by shining a light in front of the patient's eyes. The afferent fibers from cranial nerve 2 carry this sensory information, while the afferent parasympathetic fibers from cranial nerve 3 carry information back to the eye causing constriction of the pupiloconstrictor muscle. These parasympathetic fibers also innervate the ciliary muscle for accommodation, which relaxes and allows the lens to thicken for better close vision. Parasympathetic fibers are carried on the outside of the main nerve bulk, and thus with compression of cranial nerve 3, one will see pupil dilation. Diabetes can lead to nerve infarcts due to small vessel disease of the vasonevorum, here, the internal fibers are damaged while external parasympathetic fibers are spared. Motor findings predominate, however, the pupil is spared. Patients have ptosis and the eye is abducted. Ocular migraine can also cause this to occur transiently. The posterior communicating artery course brings it in close proximity to cranial nerve 3. The artery can develop an aneurysm at its intersections, which can compress the nerve. When this happens, the parasympathetic fibers on the surface are first affected and will result in pupillary dilation on that side. This is because of unrestricted sympathetic drive to dilate the pupil. If the aneurysm is large enough, you might see some of the muscles activated by cranial nerve 3 affected and the patient develops diplopia. Cranial nerve 3 also passes along the medial temporal lobe region, known as the cerebral temporal uncus. In circumstances of rapid increased intracranial pressure, the uncus may bulge into and between the falx cerebri, where it will compress cranial nerve 3. This condition is called uncle herniation and leads to pupil dilation, cranial nerve 3 palsy, and usually coma. There may be plegia ipsilateral or on the same side as the pupillary dilation, 
due to compression of the cerebral peduncle or the cruse cerebri by the opposite side of the Falk's cerebri. One would normally expect plegia on the opposite side of the pupil sign, and this special unexpected pathology is known as Kernahan's notch. Midbrain stroke will often cause ocular movement issues, especially when there is involvement of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, provoking diplopia. Muscle diseases or myopathies and disorders of the neuromuscular junction affect ocular motility. What about the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4? The nucleus of cranial nerve 4 is in the midbrain. Fibers cross the midbrain before exiting dorsally on the opposite side. It enters the cavernous sinus, traverses it, traveling with cranial nerve 3 and 6, and exits into the orbit. It innervates the superior oblique muscle, which rotates the eye inward and, when abducted, downward. In cranial nerve 4 dysfunction, the patient has inability to gaze down and in toward the nose. The eye is deviated upward and outward. This creates vertical diplopia. This might provoke the patient to hold their head slightly tilted away from the affected side, which corrects the eye misalignment. The fourth nerve has the longest course of all the cranial nerves. This and the fact that these nerves course from the dorsal surface to the ventral surface make it vulnerable to trauma, and it is often injured in closed head injuries. Other pathologies which may affect cranial nerve 4 include aneurysm, infection, and neoplasm. Let's finish by looking at the abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6. The nucleus of cranial nerve 6 is located in the pons. Its course from its dorsal midbrain exit takes it into the cavernous sinus and then into the orbit. Cranial nerve 7 passes dorsally around the nucleus of cranial nerve 6. Cranial nerve 6 innervates the lateral rectus muscle, which moves the eye laterally. Trauma to the orbit, cavernous sinus thrombosis, and tumors in the cerebellopontine angle region might also affect this cranial nerve. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.